Hi everyone. So, so my my uh, my, my session will be first telling people what is uh, blockchain all about. You know, the introduction to the concept. Um, also, at the same time, I also want to take this opportunity to tell everybody, you know, to look at the technology deeper. You know, because I I, I give a lot of different advice to different government, you know, whether it's from supply chain or whether it's in the med, uh, med tech section and so forth. I, I realized that, you know, many, many of the government friends, you know, they are all looking at using the technology at the back end, you know. But more recently, you know, when I, I, I can't mention the country, but more recently, one of the minister in Europe that I met, you know, they are looking at how they could implement cryptocurrency, how they can implement crypto-related incentive program, you know, for their citizens, you know. Um, and I think things like this would be very interesting, you know. So later on, I will try to cover as much as I can. So this is me, um, I'm a book author. Uh, usually that's what I tell my, all my friends. Um, and for everybody, I, I bought my own book on Amazon. Uh, every one of you will have one of them. Later on, I'll, I'll share it with you. Um, I'm also an advisor to a Mongolian productivity organization. Formerly, I was the uh, blockchain advisor to APO as well. I do a lot of different things. You know, during my introduction, I also mentioned that I run a fund. You know, we invest in different projects. We invest in different technology. Um, so I'm also chairman of Neuron. So that is an AI company that is based in Singapore. And then, um, apart from all this, you know, I was formerly a uh, advisor to uh, Hyundai. You know, um, looking at building blockchains with them. You know, the car brand. Um, I'm also a partner in a, in a venture fund. I also do a lot of different work with uh, NFT. So if you look at the screen right now, there's a seed. Seed is actually an NFT marketplace. I try to spend a lot of time doing all this. Not only because I, I believe in the technology, but I also believe in how to implement that. So today I'm here to share. You know, there are things that I, I might not be able to share in depth. If you have time, if you want to catch me, the long tea breaks, please do so. You know, I'm very happy to answer anything. Okay. So what is blockchain? You know, Dr. Jose mentioned, it's a very simple thing. It's a distributed database or ledger among a computer network with different nodes. So this is a very simple concept, you know. Do you need to take this very seriously? Uh, no need, because there are, there's a lot of different kind of uh, ways to describe you know, what blockchain is really like. But to me, it is actually more like a database, just to be very, very honest. So, it, so it's an open distributed ledger that can record the transaction between two parties efficiently in a verified way and in a more permanent manner. You know, that is a very straightforward way to explain in a very simple manner. So these are the key characteristics, you know, if it's open, it's distributed, leisure, it's P2P, you know, and it's permanent. These are terms that will be presented throughout my slides, probably also with Dr. Ram's slides as well, because these are the key characteristics, you know, it's, it's not going to change. You know, these are some of the things that we are trying to sell. You know, if you if you again look at how the technology work, you know, it's all revolved around all these different key factors. You know, so brief introduction. You know, using crypto cryptography to keep exchanges secure, blockchain provides that decentralized database or digital ledger of transaction that everyone on the network can see. So this is. 
the main gist of it. You know, it's an exchange. You know, in a decentralized database. Of course, in different kind of uh, blockchain, it can be centralized, a little bit more centralized, can be a bit more hybrid. You know, but this network essentially is a chain of computer that must approve an exchange before it can be verified and recorded. You know, this again is very very suitable for government related kind of uh, initiative you know whether it's a digital id whether it's going to be in the supply chain sector you know or whether it's going to be in the, in the medical record sector these are all the key concepts so it's a digital record of transaction the name come from a structure and then the individual blocks are uh, records are called blocks and they are linked together in a single list and this is called a chain. Blockchain are used for recording transactions made with cryptocurrencies such as a Bitcoin and of course they have a lot of different layers that are building on top of it. It can be a decentralized layer, you know, right now we could even talk about like a layer tree, so forth and so on. So how does the blockchain work, you know? Look at the screen, it's uh, more straightforward. If A wants to send money to B, transaction is uh, represented as a block. The block is then broadcasted to every party in the network. The party approved, the block is added to the existing blockchain in a transparent way, and the transaction is completed. It seems very easy, you know, but there's a lot of different steps along the, the whole process, right? But the concept is very easy. You know, if you're doing like a FinTech, business, this is a really part of what you're doing and this is just an added on, you know, to the to whatever that you're trying to do. So again, if, if you look, if you Google my name, you know, back in 2018, I was uh, talking about supply chain, you know, how things can be more traceable, you know, how the big brands can use uh, blockchain technology to authenticate their products, you know, I think all these things are still very valid in, in today's context, you know. So if, if you look at it, how, how, how the goods are being received, you know, how the goods are being recorded on chain, how the goods are then being verified, you know, how the payment can, can be made you know, through cryptocurrency, this is just one whole cycle of what you're seeing right now. Ooh, my bad. Key concepts again, decentralization, transparency, immutability, and then there's always a consensus mechanism. I'll go into a little bit more detail as we move along. So decentralization, unlike traditional database managed by a single entity, blockchain operates on a peer-to-peer -peer network. Every participant in the network has access to the entire database and its complete history. You know, so things are all recorded in a way, in a decentralized manner. It can be different blocks, but of course, when you all combine together, you will get the full information. So transparency is transactions on the blockchain are visible to all participants, providing a high level of transparency. Each participant can verify the data independently. So this is how we see uh, transparency. But of course, you know, when it comes to transparency, there's also a privacy issue. You know, but that is something that we can, we can deal with uh, at a later stage. So once, once recorded data in the blockchain cannot be altered, you know, each block is linked to the previous one, creating a secure and immutable chain of transaction. So things are more permanent in, in that manner, right? So again, you know, whenever we talk about permanent and so forth, I'm not sure any one of you has the uh, NFTs. Cool, man. Good job. Yeah, no, no, I, I like NFT in terms of the technology. So again, if you Google myself, I was actually part of the Bybit team. So Bybit is the world's second largest exchange right now. I think globally, they are everywhere. So I, I am in charge of uh, F1, you know, so we did a series of NFTs. Good, good response, you know, because to be very honest, during the bad times, like last year, we are still able to sell engage with the fans, you know, and still get a very decent number of millions of, uh, of sales. I think that is, that is really interesting. 
Well, why am I saying this? You know, everything is, is, is permanent and I bring out NFT. You know, to be very honest, if you have played NFT in 2017, maybe, maybe, 18, 19, okay, never mind, 2020, okay? 21. Okay, that's when the market is really good, you know, and everybody is going to tell you that NFT, that picture or whatever that you have is permanent, right? Yes. Yes? Have you checked your, your transaction recently? Okay. So, so please, if you have NFT, sometimes whatever they say, it might not be 100% true. You know, yes, the records are there, but if you look at the NFT that you had in 2021, and if the project is dead, Yes, when you click on the JPEG picture, you cannot see anything, you know. Yeah, the record is permanent, you know, but the asset on chain yeah. Yeah, is the not very permanent. permanent. Yeah. The so, so that will be quite funny, you know. So if you're lucky, you click, you can be an empty picture. <laughs> Sometimes you cannot even find the empty picture. So let's, let's, uh, let's talk about more, more about that, you know, later. Consensus mechanism, you know, there's a proof of work, proof of stake. You know, these are all the more common uh, consensus mechanism. You know, do you need to know? Mm, no, not really. You know, because if you if you work with different government, sometimes the consensus mechanism is also very different. You know, it's not so complex. You know, maybe the consensus mechanism is between five, ten, twenty people. You know, it really depends on how you, you know, how you structure everything. Hmm. Okay, application of uh, blockchain, you know, anyone into property, you know, in the, in the property world, anyone into the energy, distributed storage, um, digital identity, machine learning, healthcare, so all these things can be part of it, you know, but, but to me, which is uh, not part of this, uh, this diagram, is that I, I often look at blockchain as a means of helping AI and also making things a lot more automated, you know? Because when you have AI, a lot of things are just kind of intelligent, but you also need a gatekeeper. So blockchain to me is also a gatekeeper, and that is really going to be very helpful if you are going into like a, you know, like APO, they like to talk about industrial 4.0, about automation, you know, how they could bring AI into the productivity and make things a lot better. We, we need the blockchain layer, you know. Of course, n whenever this is being done, sometimes we don't really tell people that, oh, this thing is using a blockchain and so forth, you know, because blockchain sometimes is linked directly to cryptocurrency and some governments really don't really like that, you know. But in the longer run, a lot of these things will be combined and I think, you know, you will see a lot of different applications. So how blockchain influence in, uh, influences in uh, cryptocurrency? So the blockchain concept enable the secure um, of all these uh, transactions. In addition to challenging traditional banking, blockchain enables financial institutions to utilize uh, decentralized digital asset for their advantage. You know, and blockchain decentralized and secure the transaction independently, recording each transaction on a distributed ledger the cryptographic security of this transaction guarantees the immutability, transparency, and boosting the trust and the integrity within the whole network itself. So let's look at uh, how blockchain um, function in uh, the banking sector. You know, um, I give uh, different uh, talks. You know, uh, maybe to. Uh, our neighbor in Thailand, you know, I think they, they, they did a lot of different banking work um, using cryptocurrency. So blockchain technology is transforming the financial sector with applications like uh, Bitcoin transaction, you know, that would be something newer, uh, crowdfunding, SME, financing, securities management. So these are some of the applications. International payment, right? So blockchain enable it to be fast, real time, low cost, you know, reducing intermediaries and a lot of different fees. Um, but we also need to understand that if we implement this, you know, things can also be 24 seven, right? Again, there's a layer of uh, automation. So it can, it can be 24 seven, you know, it can be used as a, 
uh, identity, identity uh, verification because it is tamper proof. You could do your banking transaction, credit card application, you know, using using the blockchain. This is a case of uh, DBS uh, Bank. You know, they even have their own um, digital exchange where they could provide a certain um, transaction in terms of cryptocurrency, you know, to their banking clients, you know, to their institutions and so forth. And this is a real example. And they are also one that are doing 24-7 multi-currency transaction, you know, uh, within the whole banking um, uh, structure, you know. Um, they also provide other API uh, solution, you know, to provide a more secure uh, banking experience using the blockchain technology. So these DBS, you could always uh, Google them online. Uh, all information are public, you know. And, and I always love to use uh, DBS as an example because I, I have very good friends there. You know, in my um, in my fund, you know, my co GP is also a, a, a very senior banker. So we often meet up with different bankers from uh, DBS, uh, from Citibank, and so forth to tell them what else we can do, you know, as a uh, as a fund, of course, and also I introduce them to different technology providers to see how they can better enhance their current banking system and experience. So, next one will be healthcare. You know, uh, blockchain technology enhances a lot of healthcare. You know, patients' data, transparency, tracking, and account what is being done. You know, I, I can't mention which country, but one of these country in the, oops, in, in the um, North Asia, you know, they, they, they approach us because they have their own healthcare system where healthcare is 100% uh, subsidized, you know, but in the healthcare card, they do not have a picture, you know, and there's no way, you just, just go to Dr. A, you provide the card, they'll give, give it to you for free, and that creates a big problem because I'm Andy, you are Andy, he's Andy, everybody's Andy, right? They can use the same card to do all this transaction. They found out, you know, and at the end, they also implemented uh, blockchain technology at the back end so that they can identify each and every um, uh, patient, you know, and then provide a certain uh, record management for your medical on chain as well, you know, so that people can verify. You know, it's, it's very easy to verify. If you are a dentist, you have this tooth decay or that tooth is gone. How could it be another ND coming in with more, more teeth, right? So, so with all these things, it, it creates an environment where people can be more trusting, you know? So look at the EHR program. Uh, these are all existing ones, you know, patient record uh, management program, uh, drug traceability program. You know, some of them even have a incentivized uh, micropayment uh, program where they encourage you to, to use their program to use the EHR uh, a network, for example, and at the same time provide a certain level of incentive. You know, so this become a more holistic way to make sure that you use it. You use it, you have incentive. You have incentive, you can use the incentive to do maybe a blood test or buy some vitamins and so forth. You know, so this is um, what is happening in the healthcare space. Um, another case study is about Ethereum Enterprise. So a lot of, uh, I think Ethereum is widely known and used. Uh, have anyone not heard of Ethereum? Okay. Don't worry, we, we, will, we will try my best, okay? So, so they, they have their own uh, enterprise system uh, uh, where they can uh, uh, enable secure data. You know, they manage the different patients' uh, data protection, patients' record, you know, and they do a lot of uh, different kind of uh, data point for scientific purposes as well. So impact of uh, on patient consent management is always structured data. Um, is a selective sharing. You know, patients can grant uh, full visibility to different stakeholders. I give you a real example. You know, I, I, I also used to invest in the medical, you know, and then we always find that there, there are issues. I give you an example. If you're a healthy guy, you know, a couple of uh, health records is fine, you know. But if you if you if you are a really unhealthy person, you know, maybe you have to travel to the states, or maybe you are from Indonesia, for example. You want to go to 
uh, Mayo Clinic in US just to do some checks and so forth. You have to carry a lot of records with you. It's just too troublesome. You know, or today if you're not feeling well, you have a headache, right? You go to uh, Dr. A, Dr. A will look at you and say, okay, I'm going to do this set of, uh, of uh, uh, blood tests and so forth, you know, and do this uh, x-ray. Then you get, you get the feedback from the doctor, you are not very happy about it, right? Now you go to Dr. B, but Dr. B, when you go there, they might not recognize or agree to what Dr. A has done. So you have to do the blood test again, so on and so on, because a lot of these things are not transparent. Of course, the no doctors here, right? You know, medical doctors. They, they, doctors need money too, right? So they, they keep doing it. But if you are on a blockchain system where you can selectively share what you can share, effectively you can share with Dr. A some of the information, share with Dr. B, Dr. C, Dr. D, a lot of these things can just follow through. You don't need to be poked many times, you know. Again, it depends on your healthcare standard in your country, but these are some of the things that are really happening. You know, trace your drugs, you know, there's less uh, drug abuse, you know. In some of the countries, you know, that I, I work very closely with, you know, they even have like, you know, CBD, you know, they want to control this. You know, I think drug traceability, you know, for, for pharmaceutical companies especially is really something very useful. For, for clinical trials as well, you know, there's a risk reduction in terms of uh, how they can fight against different fraud, you know, uh, proof of existence, you know, again, we talk about documents being verified, and then, of course, uh, integrity and tr uh, collaboration between the, the trial, the doctors, the researchers, and so forth. This, again, become a one whole ecosystem that we look at. Um, Again, I mentioned about the incentivization through micropayments. You know, this will be conducted through smart contracts. Um, behavior rewards, you know, maybe they could go for a certain tra uh, treatment, they share a certain level of data, you know. Uh, I think insurance company would really love this. You know, if you have a, like a, a big insurance company, they want to keep track of different medical data. This is one really good way uh, to do it. And you know, patients are then being re rewarded uh, for the for the treatment plan because a lot of tri treatment plans are not being followed, you know all these things also can rely on chain. Not sure. Okay, so enhance the transparency and accountability. The same term will be used over and over again. So I'm not going to um, say this. Okay, again, it's the same terms. So you want to be efficient, you know, again, the word automation is there. You know, you use different smart contracts. You can automate and streamline various administrative processes, um, whether it's for permits, for licenses, you know, for, for, uh, for different kind of government service. You know, His Excellency has mentioned a lot of things are all digitized right now. Um, but also at the same time, you know, if you go to some other countries, you know, they are using the blockchain uh, uh, mechanism, you know, for their title deeds, for their home, for their properties, and so forth. Because, you know, not all countries are all well recorded. You know, some people will claim that they have uh, th their own title deeds. Maybe they have two title deeds. You know, so all these things are really happening. So that kind of automation process, you know, um, and keeping track of all the different kind of transaction is actually very important. Um, we also talk about a secure uh, digital identity, you know, so use the blockchain uh, to identify different systems, you know, to reduce uh, identity fraud, uh, thefts, and so forth. You know, for crypto exchanges, for example, you ask for KYC, KYB, for example, you know, some of, some of the exchanges are also looking at creating their own identity management system where things can only be Recorded once, you know, because some people have different identity, right? So they might be today, it might be a Turkish, tomorrow it'll be a Singaporean, you know. So exchanges are trying to minimize this kind of movement. So if your name is ABC, if your face is this, you can only have one account, you know. So these are things that are really happening in the space, you know. Then again, there's always just one single proof 
source of truth. And very similar to what I mentioned about crypto exchanges, you know, these are some of the things that they are trying to implement. Transparency in terms of uh, voting, e-voting. You know, any, most of the countries that are e-vote, right? I mean, it's no longer manual voting. I hope so, right? <laughs> at, at least you have votes, you know? So, so blockchain can enable secure and transparent uh, electronic voting systems. Again, it's going to be tamper proof. There are a lot of different examples that happen, whether it's in Asia, you know, whether it's in Europe. You know, this is one good example. They are the first nation to do that. You know, they have their own uh, land title on blockchain. Lower time of transaction, completion can be a lot faster. Real estate deals can be completed in the matters of days rather uh, than months. You know, so this is one one good example. Another example would be Estonia. They use the blockchain technology to enforce integrity within the whole government system. It increases security and it integrates with the existing systems. You know, so if if you if you are in your own government sector, you know, you are doing different things. You know, for your ministry. You know, many times if you speak to a, like a blockchain vendor or a security vendor, they will try to tell you, hey, change your system, you know, change your, your system, pay this amount to change your system, you know, it's always trying to tell you this, this, this logic, you know, but if you just imagine if you are paying, you know, five, 10 million of US dollar in your legacy systems, you, you really do not want to change everything, right? And that could really screw things up. So I think the main keyword to use is to integrate with the current one, you know, and and I think that is not difficult. You know, you will not disrupt your work. You will not disrupt, you know, other people's work. You know, and and if you can do it part by part, you know, that is that is a very good baby step for you to move forward. You know, in implementing different technology. You know, so I think the thing is to to choose the right vendor. You know, I I don't have anything to sell, but if you need any form of uh, recommendation, I could always uh, send you some really reputable. Uh, technology team so that you could get yourself well prepared and uh, well taken care of, you know. So I always want to share things that are more relevant and I also want to share a video every time at the closing to the end of uh, every session. So can I, can we share the video please? Can you play the video? Yeah. So this is about they Estonia. Are yeah. The capital of Estonia. The Baltic country is home to 1.3 million people and to one of the most advanced digital societies in the world. From e residency to online voting to national ID cards, we're here to see how Estonia can be a blueprint for other countries looking to go digital. For our first stop, we went straight to the top with a visit to Estonia's president, Kirsty Kellyluck. If you could describe Estonia's digital society to someone who's maybe never heard of it before, what would you say? You can apply for a passport, you can apply for a driver's license, you can sell your car and buy your car online, register it online. So most of the services in Estonia, when it concerns public service, uh, is digital. We have a generation who has grown up knowing that uh, you communicate digitally. Estonians realized because they embraced the internet and technology, business and everything, Instead of just having an offline ID card, you also need something that works online. So we are inside the showroom of eEstonia, which showcases a lot of the country's digital solutions. We're going to take a look at the electronic ID and digital signatures. Every Estonian is issued a digital ID. Physical ID cards are paired with digital signatures that citizens use to pay taxes, vote, do online banking, and access their healthcare records. For a small country, the impact of the digital signatures has been saving the government an estimated 2% of GDP per year in salaries and expenses. Estonia says 99% of its public services are available online 24-7. It takes under five minutes to fill out taxes online, around one-third of citizens vote online, and 99% of prescriptions are issued electronically. Health records can be shared among doctors using a single electronic file that the owner can see at any point in time, too. So here you can see a list of doctors that I have been in treatment with. Everything that regards your health record 
big feature of Estonia's digital society is the e-residency program. This basically allows you to start a company here in Estonia even if you're not a resident. E-residents can benefit from the European Union's single market without actually living in the EU. Estonia was the first country in the world to offer e-residency, and so far more than 15,000 people have applied for the program since it launched in 2014. So we are on our way to meet with Tavi Kunka. Tavi is a well-known presence in Estonia as the country's first chief information officer. We just started to think about it, like how we can increase the amount of people who connect to Estonia. We had this like approach is question different, then we took the approach that okay, why not we connect them digitally? So how did Estonia become so high tech? It all started in 1991 when the country gained independence from the Soviet Union. The government embarked on a series of fast track reforms to modernize the economy, and it saw investments in technology as a key way to boost economic growth. By 2000, all schools were equipped with computers, and today's children as young as seven years old learn how to code. The government also offered free computer training to 10% of the adult population. These efforts helped raise the percentage of Estonians who use the internet from 29% in the year 2000 to an impressive 91% in 2016. Skype was one of Estonia's early tech success stories. The video chatting company, which was bought by Microsoft, was founded here in 2003. Estonia claims it's home to more tech unicorns, which are private companies valued at more than $1 billion per capita than any other small country in the world. Its recent unicorns include payments company TransferWise and Uber competitor Taxify. Other companies focusing on everything from blockchain to organic food are now vying to be the next Estonian unicorn. I think the environment that is set up right now is very friendly and I hope to keep it this way. So the road to a digital society here in Estonia hasn't been without bumps along the way. In 2007, the country suffered a massive cyber attack which forced the government to take steps for protecting online security. Estonia helped launch a branch of NATO devoted to fighting similar attacks. The government created a data embassy in Luxembourg where it stores copies of all of its data. And schools teach cyber hygiene starting in elementary school. The efforts haven't stopped cyber attacks altogether, but today many people here are convinced their data is safer online than on pen and paper. You actually see has access to data, what data was collected, why, how it was used, and, and if you have an ability to control that, you can cover it, you can delete it, etc. It actually gives you more privacy. One thing we learned about Estonia's digital society, it's not enough just to keep up with technology. As its population ages, Estonia is trying to lure in high-skilled workers like digital nomads, remote workers who use technology to do their jobs anywhere around the world. We're heading in to meet Carolee Hendricks. She's the CEO of a company called Jumpatical. She's working with Kilo Bansi from the Estonian Interior Ministry to develop what would be the world's first digital nomad visa. It's one example of a public-private partnership at work. I really reflect on uh, what uh, our whole immigration policy is about. We want to attract uh, talented people, entrepreneurs that are beneficial to our society, to our economy. Do you see that's important to be attracting skilled workers? The loudspeaker of the world, which means uh, United States right now, or Brexit, it kind of seems that loud is closing down, but there's a lot of countries who are actually thinking about how to make it easier, how to attract people, where people will move will very much define the um, failure or success of economy, right? So we're seeing how initiatives like the Digital Nomad Visa and e-residency are encouraging startups and entrepreneurs here in Estonia. This is a tenable complex. It's home to more than 200 tech companies. Rick Groose founded a health tech company whose app helps detect early stages of skin cancer. The small environment, the digital environment, people are uh, very open for new innovations. As a market size, it's not that big, so you really have to think big uh, at the very first step and think of your growth plans into other countries and other continents. Even. Replicating Estonia's digital success in bigger, more diverse countries will be easier said than done. After all, the entire population here is roughly equivalent to that of Dallas. But in a world that's only getting more digital, there are a lot of lessons we can learn from this glimpse into the future. Hey guys, Elizabeth here, coming to you from Estonia. Thanks so much for... So this is... Um, this is a video, but it's not something very new. We are... You know? In fact, I, I had the chance to meet up with different Estonian companies 
you know, who are very early in the digital space. You know, I met up with the government as well. So what, what, they, what they usually do, you know, is after doing all this implementation, they talk about different kind of, um, um, different kind of security measures and so forth. Many of them actually embark into the journey of uh, using blockchain as uh, one of their uh, security measures, you know, to protect their database, you know, and, and they are very advanced, you know. But, but I'm not saying that, you know, what they are doing is 100% uh, foolproof, you know. You really need to def look at how your ministry look at things, how this can be implemented in, in, in your world, you know. Uh, for Estonia as a case study, I think, I think I'm still fairly uh, proud of what they have done. You know, some of the companies that I've dealt with, I think they are also very advanced in terms of how they implement this uh, blockchain technology into their back end. But trust me, most of them do not really talk about it. You know, they, don't, they will not tell you that, hey, uh, you know, we are using a blockchain te technology. You know, they care more about how the e user experience is, is like, you know, because to them, blockchain gives them a certain level of security. And, and again, to them, this is something that they must do. You know, so they, most of the time they will not tell you that, oh, this is what we have done, but this is definitely part of their plan at back end. You know, so this is um, session one of what I want to share. You know, there are a lot of, uh, if you have different questions, like I've mentioned in the earlier um, uh, uh, conversation, please come by, say hi. You know, there are always different ways that your department can use and utilize blockchain, you know. It can be a very simple smart contract, you know, it can be a very simple certificate uh, verification. You know, in Singapore we had we, we have this as well, you know, recognize your certificates. Of course I'm not saying that a lot of people you you know they use a fixed certificates, but you know HR or, or you know all these uh, hiring companies they had a hard time too, you know, trying to verify different certificates and so forth. So in Singapore we have that kind of a technology and platform. Same for some other countries as, as well, you know. So again, there are many different ways to, to, to do that, you know. We have a bit of time, you know, if you want, you could, we could ask some questions. You know, if not, if not, we could uh, definitely jump to the next section. You know, any questions that you want to ask or want to do it privately? Hey, man. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Anki, for a very interesting talk. I was just wondering, actually, based on your uh, experiences, you have already worked with several uh, government, right? And also you deal also with the private sectors. So can you share also what are the common, how do you call it, recipe for disasters that is commonly you facing when you deal with the public sector? Because public sector are and work differently, right, with respect to the startup or private sector, so that we can avoid such a. Sure. Sure. I, I, I think because uh, you. when you deal with the, the different departments, sometimes they take a longer time for them to make a decision. You know, so so back in two zero one eight, for example, you know, like uh, blockchain, like EOS, for example, they are still very popular. You know, by the time some of these uh, government uh, entity decides on what to do, you know. Maybe the EOS blockchain is no longer popular, you know, and and maybe they find that it's difficult to get different updates and so forth. So my humble advice is to find the right blockchain, you know, for them to, to use it, you know. And if you are certain that they are only going to do a private blockchain themselves, you know, then then they must think of the roadmap very clearly. Because, you know, I was in Turkey as well. You know, my, my friend was there. You know, we we talk about how to maybe use blockchain for a few billion worth, you know, a few billion data sets, for example. You know, I was telling them it's, 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 not, it's not worth it to put everything on chain, you know. Maybe you can put some data that you want to verify on chain, you know, or some data sets that you, you, you think that is useful on chain, but, but most of the government guys, you know, they think of it as a really big project, you know, and at the end, it's very hard for them to implement, or maybe there's no longevity all these things you know so I always try to tell different ministries to keep things simple so that you could do things more effectively showcase 
what you can do, and then your minister will be happy. And of course, if the minister stays on, you know, you can have a good portfolio, right? So, so I think that should be small little steps for, for your department to achieve some milestone, you know, instead of doing something that is really super huge. You know, that's, that's my humble opinion. I hope that answers that question as well. Any, any other questions? No, no problem. I, in fact, the uh, I'm actually using a Canva, you know, so the link can be shared with everybody. I can just paste in that. There's no problem at all. Yeah, I'll paste it in the group. Yeah. You can bring back. Hi. I just have a question. Uh, sure. I'm just wondering, um, well, in, in our country, one of our challenges would be convincing our our decision makers or our executives to all of these emerging technologies as such as a practitioner and also as one who uh, give advices and uh, um, yeah advices to some of the companies how would you convince someone or a hierarchy who doesn't really uh, that knowledgeable in technology in terms of the application of blockchain technology in the processes, it's not it's not an easy process, you know. Uh, um, in fact, uh, when I was uh, being invited to specific countries, they actually do not know what they want, you know. And because I'm not there permanently, it's very difficult for me to convince them. So usually, what I would do for cases like this is that, you know, I would tell them that, you know, look, for example, in the ABC country. I have uh, some friends that I can introduce you to them. Speak to them first, know about what you want, and if you think that this is something that you can implement. Again, usually a small project, implement it. Try it out first, you know, pilot trial it, you know. Because with pilot trial number one, the time frame is shorter, the amount of money that you're gonna spend is lesser. So the ministry would love to just test and run it. I think that is one of the key things that is uh, really missing in, in the Southeast Asia context. You know, most of them, when they come to me, oh man, the project is big, man. You know, really big. I was like, huh? Are you sure you want to do that? Yeah, but go again, go home. yeah, because go big, go home. Yeah, yeah. Most of the time. The minister say that, go big or go home, right? I know. <laughs> Make sure the minister uh, is a first year minister. You know? If not later, you only go home, you know. <laughs> So, so again, it's uh, do step by step, you know. So if you do it step by step, tell them there's a need, and, and you as the director of the company or the, or the ministry, you identify the gaps, implement it small, you know. Some, some, some people will tell me, oh, I want to do, I want to change the whole supply chain uh, environment, you know, because there's a lot of uh, different fraud in the building, you know, big bill of lading and so forth. I say that, that can't be done, you know. You have so many people that is uh, taking the taking the money per se. How are you going to use blockchain to solve this? So I tell them that's not possible. How about just uh, uh, use the blockchain technology to upload your bill of lading, for example. You know, because those are some things that you want to keep a record, a more permanent record. You know, or maybe the example that I have for uh, certificates. I think th these are really small examples that ministry can, can do. You know, in Philippines, I, I, one of my friends, I think he passed on um, uh, two years ago. He's also helping um, Cambodia and also helping uh, Philippines to look at uh, identity, uh, uh, identity, um, uh, identity card, you know, how you do all these things on blockchain. You know, I think he did a fairly good job. You know, and again, again it's just a pilot trial. You know, it takes a lot of uh, courage for the ministry to, to do that big time, you know? And because a lot of these countries are, are not Estonian, you know, they are very early in that step, you know, they try to digitize everything, you know, so if you really want to do that, do it small, you know, find a small gap, make sure they are convinced. After they are convinced, they will know that it's easier to do. You know, in, in terms of banking, for example, you know, you can tell them it's a very straightforward thing. You can do all these transactions 24-7. You know, you do not need to have a person physically just staying there to do all this, uh, all this micro work, you know. 
if they are able to do that baby step, you know, they will feel the good in terms of productivity. You know, it's more efficient. They will definitely do it. You know, again, it has to keep it small. That's my humble two cents worth. As far as these applications are concerned, it's okay. But uh, when we talk about the uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, these are also part of blockchain. So uh, if we take example of my country, uh, there are many people who are doing uh, cryptocurrencies and they are uh, sending their monies in uh, different cryptocurrency uh, apps. So do you think that uh, sending all the money in uh, investing in cryptocurrencies, uh, there may be a chance of bankrupt in a country, because every uh, person hides his, its uh, money and send it to uh, different uh, cryptocurrency uh, like Binance or some, something else. So what do you think about it? Well, if the country is gonna bankrupt, you bankrupt, you know, but, <laughs> but the, the, it's not, has, it has nothing to do with the cryptocurrency, but, but coming back to the, how the circumvent is, if, if you look at the South Korean uh, environment, you know, I think they, I think they have a very good case study. They have like one or two or maybe maximum three crypto exchanges. You know, everything is controlled. You know, your bank account is controlled. You know, a bank account is tagged to your name. You know, if you want to transfer this out to other countries, is 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 not is not you can't you can't do it. You know, so there's a certain travel rule that's very very specific. You know, and and if you have that kind of specific travel rule. The country will not go bankrupt because at the end, taxation-wise, you can still tax it, you know, and they can't transfer all the money out uh, instantly, you know. So don't need to worry about that, you know, from a crypto perspective. Wait, hi. Sorry. Is that for mics? Okay. Okay. I, I like private guns. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so my question is like. Oftentimes when we're working on a blockchain project, it's financed or it's funded by some entity. Yeah. And typically that entity owns that project. Mm. Uh, and so then the, the kind of application, the value of blockchain uh, is, is kind of put into question because ultimately it's, it's a system that is just a digital system. So I think the lines between, oh, it's just a digitization initiative that it could be like a normal application on a normal database versus something that the blockchain is adding in value. Uh, because it, it's, it's very rarely something that's truly a cooperation between multiple entities that uh, each kind of finance it collectively and then they have something going on together. It's typically like say if it's, even if it's a government entity, say it's government of India sponsoring a project, then government is owning a database. At the end of the day, it's, it's, what, what is the value that they can get in addition uh, to uh, on top of any regular database, I think that that's what really trips me up sometimes. Uh, this is a tough one, but but if, if you look at it this way, yeah, um, in most of the companies that we see right now, whether it's blockchain, private companies, banking, it, it's made up of different investors, right? So so the investor actually do not have the power, you know, to change the whole blockchain structure, right? So that's how I that's how I look at it because. If you look at it from a, from a centralized perspective, you know, so that, that few investors got to go to the database, open up the server rack, pick this out. Oh yeah, I, I have everything, right? But if you are doing this in a, in a proper blockchain manner, you know, a public blockchain manner, there's no way, man, you know, unless they gather everyone from APO, everyone, you know, bring your database, you know, connect together, else you will not get the full, the, the, the full, the full sets of data. The, the, right? the only caveat is that it is those investors that are financing the project in the first place. So if we go to them and say, look, you should do this so that you can't tamper with it, it's, it's not as big of a value add to them as, a, as a, an investor. I, I, especially if it's a government project. Uh, so it's a government entity that's starting, say, an identity management project. They have something that works that doesn't use blockchain. And now we're saying, oh, something blockchain related could add value, but it's like, wait, I own the data anyway. <laughs> I think if, if you base on this, then anything on Amazon is going to be very dangerous, right? So again, you know, Amazon or whichever uh, Ali uh, Cloud, etc., et they, they have their own set of uh, corporate uh, ethics, you know, to follow, right? So there's no way you could you could really 
uh, do that. You know, if, if, if that will happen, everything is not safe, right? Because a lot of these service provider, you know, they, they are using all this uh, uh, AWS and so forth. But, but if you look at it this way, you know, company level, you have your own set of uh, structure, right? Then on the blockchain, you also have your own uh, protocol and structure. I think that is an added layer of security. I give you an example, you know, like we run a fund, right? Um, in, a, in a normal banking uh, method, in the past, you know, if we want to send out money, Lady A forged my signature, Mr. Hansen forged my signature, two signature, you know, the, the check is okay, right? It's gone. Same for the banking, right? But in the, in the blockchain environment, you can also do something very similar with a multi sig uh, uh, kind of uh, signature on, on, on to, to make the transaction go through, you know, and you have a hard wallet, cold wallet, and so forth. There's a lot of different measures, you know. In order for you to activate that database and steal everything, for example, if it's possible, you have to go through so many different people, right? So there's, of course, there are ways to do it, but it's being reduced uh, significantly in my, in my humble opinion. You know, some of my friends, they also kept uh, their assets, you know, on uh, cold wallet, you know, they put one in uh, South Korea, put one in India, and so forth. It's good, man. But shit, you know, sorry, but one day if I need the money, you know, sometimes I I, I need to get all this uh, all this uh, uh, hardware together and make it work. You know, it's also very troublesome. You know, so again, it's not so straightforward. You know, uh, and I I hope they will implement. You know, to be very honest. Yeah. Uh, so that is a. Consensus mechanism is the mic. Yeah. Um, hi, Andy. Um, yeah, no, no yeah. worries. Um, yeah, you've mentioned um, a lot of use cases, applications, and even highlighted the, the uh, potential of the blockchain in terms of decentralization, immutability, transparency, and all sorts of the, uh, all sorts of feature. But my question is, I think it's related somehow to the previous question. Can you, uh, as an expert in blockchain, can you give us, um, or if you have an in indicative test or somehow a litmus test, when to implement blockchain? Because as you know, emerging technology, well, in the boom of AI, there's AI for everything afterwards. Like everything's implementing AI. Um, just like in blockchain, when they, when they heard about blockchain, everyone wants to implement blockchain. Blockchain for this, for that. So as an expert, what would you recommend, or if you have any indicatives, uh, indicatives uh, test or litmus test, when to implement blockchain? Because as we all know, technology is not a foolproof solution to everything. Um, well, well uh, some will contest that we can do everything in a centralized manner. We just need to implement these technologies that you've mentioned, cryptography, uh, security, uh, all sorts of encryption and all. So, yeah, primarily my question is about your litmus test or indicative test. Sure. Um, I, I think for, for this test, it, it, it really depends, right? So, so in, in different cases, you know, there are like private blockchains, you know, this private blockchain is somewhat, decent, uh, is somewhat centralized, right? Uh, some of the governments are actually using them, you know, uh, they're good and bad uh, to, to such a mechanism. But if you're talking about a public blockchain, for example, you know, when you implement it. I think if you, as long as your items are, or whatever that you're trying to do is already digitized, you know, and again, it's not like a huge project, few billion worth of database uh, sets and so forth. I think you can try using that as a database, you know, from a, from a backend. You know, again, without better example, you know, it can be property deeds, you know, it's very straightforward, you know, because one property only have one deed, right? So it's very straightforward. You can use this as a trial run. Uh, some of the countries recently came to me, they talk about stamp, stamping system. You know, we also talk about certification for a degree. There's a lot of things that can be done, but as long as, to me right now at this current moment is, as long as the project is not huge, not the go home or, you know, you know or, or go with nothing, you know, as long as it's not huge, um, Ministry can see the benefits straightforward. I think they could use that straight away. You know, so so again, um, blockchain uh, school certificates. I think that that is something really very easy to do. It, you know, and in fact, um, the government or Ministry of Information or whichever ministry, you know, they could create a smart contract and then pass that smart contract audited 
to the different um, schools and they could just implement it on, on, on their own. You know, it's very, it's very straightforward. You know, and the privacy level is there. You know, it's just a few lines of codes. You know, so I think that that should be useful. Yeah. Okay, time to say goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.